All right, everybody, welcome back to another Run and Gun review. Uh, real quick, I had the joy of running the Legion Memorial Run and Gun at Rock Castle Shooting Center last weekend, and uh, I did the 10K. And uh, the uh, first shout out that I'll give is to the match director, Matt Stennett, and the folks from the 5th Special Forces Group out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, for hosting an amazing match. Matt, you and all the guys from the group, you guys did an amazing job, put together an amazing match for an awesome cause for the uh, Special Forces Association and everything that you guys do in support of those guys. So Matt, my hat is off to you. As many have already said, um, you do a great job. Thank you so much. And uh, so, and then of course, with along with Matt and the folks from the group that made this happen, the folks at Rock Castle Shooting Center, you guys have an amazing facility, all of your hospitality, and especially to us range officers that come out there and the, hat, the, the hand that you extend to us and uh, allow us to come out and, uh, and run these to work them as ROs and to do everything. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, a real quick shout out to the sponsors because you know with money this stuff can't happen and the prize table and all the sponsors if you want to take a look at the shirt you guys can see some of them. I'll throw the, the picture up here too if you guys want to try to digest that but for the sponsors and everybody that came out and made this happen you guys um, uh, it, it, it just again it was an amazing an amazing time so with that um, what we'll say here is is that uh, the next kind of shout out I do is to my fellow ROs, the range officers. Um, you guys, um, Bruce and the fifth group guys, they could not have made this happen without you guys. So I was honored to be out there and ROing with Kelly and Tiger down in the cave and then everybody else that was ROing. And, and if I didn't say thank you as I showed up to a stage, I got lots of thanks while I was out there Saturday and Sunday for what we do. And so thank you guys for joining me as we always do to do these kind of things. So um, one RO that I want to especially thanks is a good friend of mine, Bruce Perry. You're going to notice in my video here, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about GoProing um, my run. Uh, and I'll talk about my run in a minute. But there were several times during the stages that I literally just did not turn on the GoPro. One was because I was so excited to shoot the stage, I forgot to turn it on. And for the last two stages, six and seven, I was just spent. Whether I didn't remember to turn it on or whether or not I just didn't care to at that point, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad that I didn't because I actually shot okay on the uh, stage six. It's the one that I... I did not finish, but I still did okay, I think. And then the stage, uh, last stage, stage, stage seven, I did, uh, I did really good. So I wish I would have turned the GoPro on for that. So we'll get to the stages here in a minute. But I want to thank Bruce Perry, and that's why I was talking about this, is because Bruce has allowed me to use his video footage that he shot, and he did great on all three of these stages that I missed shooting the GoPro for. So in this video, you're going to see my shooting, and you're going to see Bruce's shooting. And he also shot an FAL like me. So I'm proud to say that he's another FAL owner out here running these running guns and doing it with an FAL. So with that, I'll jump right into the gear that I used. So for the rifle, like you guys have seen in the past, I carried the FAL. I carried, it's a DSA SA-58. It actually has a DSA DRS stock. You've seen my video review of it and how well it does. All right, well, I ran that during this match. Okay, with the tab biathlon, biathlon sling all folded up. And it did really, really well on my back. Uh, kept the stock out of my way for obstacles and things of that nature. Ran the TA-33A cog on top and I got some Butler Creek uh, lens caps on there. So I just threw the other one off. You can see that, but they did really good um, for the match. And uh, I had encountered some rain on a previous match and figured I needed to get some scope covers for it. And I carried six 20 round Moses FAL mags for this match. And uh, I think I had two full magazines left even after clearing all the rifle stages that I did with it. So rifle did very well. The DSA ran really well, did what it was supposed to do. For pistol, I ran the Smith & Wesson Gen 2 or 2.0 uh, M&P with a long slide on it. And I carried nine 22 round magazines and I was left with almost five full 22 round magazines because it carried way too much ammo, which is part of the reason that uh, I went into uh, probably some of the close to heat exhaustion that I did during the run because of all the ammo that I was carrying and I was only in the light fighter class so glad I did not wear plates. I'll talk about a run in a minute. Uh, for gear I wore this big HSGI taco, uh, taco pouches on the uh, HSGI war belt. It's got the inner pad lining that helps out when you carry a lot of ammo. It's got a, a camelback on the back uh, attached to this H harness so I had some water 
about a, a liter and a half of water in there, drank all of it, um, and ran out uh, close to the very end, which it did its job and uh, kept me from getting heat exhaustion. Um, but uh, needless to say, being sick all week, that's kind of what I'll talk about now is the run itself and the results. Shooting-wise, I placed like nine, nine out of 30-some runners, which I was happy with my shooting. But for the run, I was probably the slowest runner, I believe, of all the classes that were out there. And, uh, and, and that's because I think I kind of overdid it coming out there, carrying all this ammo, a heavy, a heavy weapon, and then also coming out there and running this thing sick. Um, I actually ended up uh, having to break a fever Saturday evening, early Sunday morning after working in the cave all day. And uh, I was actually worried that I was suffering from heat exhaustion. I probably was at some point in, in, in some way, shape, or fashion. But uh, I broke the fever and went out Sunday, felt like a new man as I ROed in the rain all day for you guys that came out and ran on Sunday. So, um, well, like I said, once you combine my very, very slow, and you won't even call it a run, um, you, uh, you, you combine that, I dropped it down to the lower, the lower third, around 26th in the light fighter class. And uh, so with all that said, uh, I finished, um, I only DNF one stage, which I'll talk about. All the stages were amazing. These guys, they, they put together an amazing course. The course itself, um, I'm gonna talk real quick about it. Here's the map of the 10K course, and you'll see up here, this is a map that Todd Vanis actually did using his GPS, and it'll show you kind of where the 10K route went and all the distance that we does. One thing it doesn't show is the elevation, and that being the elevation that uh, Matt decided to throw in this year by making us climb up that ungodly power line cut. All right, the elevation on this course, plus the heat that we had on Friday as the ROs ran, because it was 90 some degrees with 70 some percent humidity, and I want to say the heat index probably went well over 100, which I'm surprised because I ran the summer running gun in Oklahoma and it was hotter out there, but I went lighter and didn't carry as much uh, ammo and I didn't carry as heavy a weapon, and I also wasn't sick when I was out there running it. So I think all those things put together, it caused us to, uh, you know, have uh, caused me to have the issues that I had while I was out there. Uh, the many of these stages, and I'll talk about them in a second, the stages themselves, the last four of these, I probably took a good 10 to 15 minutes, if not more, literally sitting down on my run time as I got to the stage, ungearing and just catching my breath and drinking water so that I didn't overheat and uh, geared back up and got back into the stage and shot them. Shot great, uh, but, uh, you know, like I said, is I, I probably should have planned better and uh, thought about what I was doing before stepping out on the run. So all that being said, let's move into the stages. Um, this will be the only kind of piece of running that I'm showing you here. Um, I'm not going to do even the fast forwarding through my run tracks in between stages, but this is out the gate. So as you're running down the hill, you're going down, down, down the hill from the start point, down to Doe Valley, down to stage one. Um, most of you guys know this route if you run here at Rock Castle. Uh, this is probably the only part that I was actually jogging at a pretty good pace after stage one. Because once I got to stage one, I was smoked. All right, so I was smoked, and you know what, what you see here is probably the fastest that I did during this entire course because I spent the better part of the rest of the time walking a lot of it, jogging a little bit here and there when I got to the flats, and like I said, doing a lot of sitting around and waiting as I got to the last four stages. So we'll talk about that when we get to that. So at any rate, here we go with stage one. So as you show up to stage one, um, we had a kind of a backup, so I got a little bit of wait time after that little jog. I'm already kind of feeling the pain, the, feeling the pain of maybe I'm carrying a little bit too much weight um, for this 10K that I'm about to embark upon. So um, we got to kind of watch some of the other runners shoot this stage, so I got to get a little bit of mental preparation because I had some wait time to uh, try to prepare for it. So I shot really good. I was really happy with the stage. Um, this is the one though that right out of the gate physically taxed us and you'll see that here in a minute with Rescue Randy and, uh, and what happens with this stage. So all of these stages, real quick before I go into it, they're all designed around a mission or a time at some point when the SF guys or the Green Berets have actually spent some time out in the, uh, out in the field um, and a lot of these stages are built around the point that, uh, built around the fact that they have, uh, somebody has been wounded or they have lost, um, somebody. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of taking a step back for a minute to talk about each of these stages and everything that these guys do out here. I'm actually going to post these up later so you guys can read all of this. But every one of these stages is built around a vignette, if you will, 
about a place that the SF community has been and what they have done over there. Um, and they tried to design the stages to create some realism behind the training that we were doing out here um, to reflect just a little bit, just a taste or a flavor of some of the stuff these guys are encountering every day. So again, like I said, these will be posted at the end of this. So everybody, I do implore you guys read these, okay, especially the back piece. And these are the folks that this, this specific chapter and uh, at the specific unit has lost um, out there, um, you know, in, in harm's way and doing what they do. So again, uh, this entire match and everything built around this, um, uh, all the proceeds and everything that they did for this goes to SFA, and that's the Special Forces Association, and they do a lot of stuff for the Gold Star families and the families of the, uh, the SF community and what they do. So again, like I said, is I'll talk a little bit about stages before we shoot them, just so you guys get an idea of what I was in, encountering and kind of what these things are. So stage one, um, and I believe the vignette had to do with uh, Major Carr, captain at the time, who was an OB-10 Bronco pilot and uh, in Vietnam. So I'm going back in time a little bit and talking about it. And, uh, and it, was, it was a fun, fun stage to run. And, uh, and reading each one of these vignettes prior to running each one of them, you know, really kind of puts you in, in, the, in the right sense of mind or the right frame of mind you know, before going into this. So here we go, here's my stage one. Shot it really well. A little bit of funny stuff at the end because I couldn't listen to the RO, what he's doing. So have a good time. Ready. Not on the first beat, because this beat's on the reset. Right, stand by. Not sliding down. Not sliding down too well. So six. Oh, shit. That work. Holster, right? Yep, holster. What? Hit. You did. Time? 167. No, no, no. I thought you were telling me I had time. No, you've hit it. You Mate, stop shooting. Oh. Unload. You finished. I thought I still had one sitting. No, you reset it. You hit oh, it. Oh, okay. I bust. That was a waste of ammo. Got it. Clear, mate.
Holy fuck me. All right, all right, now we go to stage two. Stage two, uh, I was actually really excited. This is the first time I mentioned earlier that I had issues with my GoPro. Well, this is where I had issues with the fact that I showed up at this stage and I was really, really excited to shoot it because I showed up and my good friend Rusty Trumbull was uh, sitting in a Polaris and then jump in, you're about to shoot the stage. So we're gonna do mounted vehicle shooting from his Polaris set targets. You'll get to see this in a minute. Not with my video though, but you're gonna get to see it in Bruce Perry's video. Bruce Perry um, allowed me, like I said earlier, to use his video footage because I was so excited to shoot this stage, I totally forgot to turn my GoPro on. Um, I shot this stage pretty good. Uh, as the vehicle shooting was going by, shooting the FAL at 308, I think I only got one complete shot on all the moving targets, but I would say that I know I hit all of the other ones at least once or twice. And the last target, I believe I actually got all three shots on. So, but 308 at that distance, if I put one round into the target and they were all kill zone shots, I'm pretty sure they'd be gone. So here goes, here's Bruce's run at this stage. And uh, he ran an FL, like I said, and again, he impresses uh, us all as he goes out and shoots CFL in these matches. So here's Bruce's video at stage two, Rusty Trombone, Rusty Trumble, Rusty Trumble's uh, Polaris vehicle mounted, mounted to dismounted shooting. You ready? Oh, you're good, Bruce. Okay. You're done. I can't. All right. Again, just like I showed you earlier, I'm not going to show you all of the running in between stage one, stage two, and this and that. I normally fast forward through that stuff anyway. But to show up to the cave, I'll real quick show you the video of the climb down to the cave for any of you guys that have never shot in the cave. All right. And, you know, what you do at Rock Castle when you go down to shoot in the cave, you know, that kind of long journey to get back to the ROs. You show up to the ROs, they give you your stage brief in the cave, and then you run through and you do what you do in the cave. Now, this is a uh, another interesting, kind of funny, this is actually my GoPro footage because I remembered to turn it on prior to shooting and uh, listened, talked, actually sat and asked questions back to the ROs as they gave me the stage brief, Kelly and uh, told me not to shoot the no shoots and what color they were. I even confirmed that and sure enough, out the gate, you know, put five close rounds right into the right into the chest of a no shoot. So you'll get to see that in the video here. But again, here's the cave. As you guys know it at Rock Castle, it's always a blast to go down there and shoot in the cave. So here's stage three. Stand by. Son of a bitch. How about doing that? I just killed the the wrong one because I didn't listen. Yeah. And then I've been putting white spray paint over it. He even told me. <laughs> that fucker deserved to die. Fuck him. Well men never listen anyway, we try and tell you. Yeah, I know.
Did I miss a shoot box? Nope, keep going. We've never gone farther than this before. <laughs> That's what she said. I hear that all the time. <laughs> all right, you're finished. You may holster. 145.74. Holster. Alrighty, stage four. Stage four. This is the first stage that I had got to after the long and arduous run around the golf course, uh, through the woods and everything else to get to Todd Bannis. And this is the first stage that I showed up at that I was like spent. I was done. Um, I sat down, ungeared. Uh, I let Mike Davis come by. I saw him catching up to me. And uh, actually, he went through. I stayed on my run time and just basically sat down and wait, uh, waited and drank some water and uh, caught my breath before I geared back up to shoot the stage. Um, and of course, you know, I'm already spent from stage one on and to my, uh, much to my, my dismay, as Todd Bannis briefs me, I'm gonna be picking up Rescue Randy again and dragging his butt all over this, if not more than what we did on stage one, but we did it again here on stage four. So again, I shot this okay all the way up until the end and even though the, state, the RO had Todd had briefed me the fact that we were going to have to shoot the last target, which would actually trigger a clay flying in the air and you take shots at it, totally forgot that that was happening. And you'll see that at the end of the video. I'm actually holstering my pistol. I look up and what do you see? The clay falling through the sky as I totally forgot to do it. And I totally spaced out and thought I hadn't turned on the GoPro for this, so I think I caught that as well. But I actually caught my shooting on this stage. So here goes, here's stage four, more rusty, uh, more Rescue Randy um, uh, pain, if you will. All right. On the start signal, which you will know. Drag him that way? To you? Yep. Cover. Put on a tourniquet? Yep. Pick a leg. Any leg. something and we'll call it good. Good enough. Take him with you, look for targets on the right. Fuck me. Is it just the one? Yep. Just the one. Ah! 
<laughs> Fuck. <coughs> All right, 141.72, no popper. Son of a bitch. I forgot to turn the GoPro on. No. Yeah. It's not beeping, is it? Hang on a second. It's got a red light. Is it? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. All right, stage five. This is another interesting stage. Um, this is where you actually show up, and you're supposed to cross the pond. Well, I actually was walking around. I was so winded at this point that uh, as I walked around, I totally missed the entrance to the pond and actually circled all the way around, which probably wasn't too safe, um, to where the RO was. He sees me coming around, and he's like, you need to cross the pond. And I'm like, what? I didn't see, I didn't see the sign that says go across the pond. So Matt Sipe, he made me go and cross the pond go out and get totally soaked and wet, which it was it was disgusting, absolutely disgusting. And the heat at this point, beating down on that pond, like I said, the heat index was well over 100 for us ROs on Friday. Um, I got done doing the whole pond thing. I again, sat down for a good bit of time, drank some more water out of my Camelback, you know, was just trying to catch my breath so that I could gear up and shoot the stage. Once I geared up and I shot the stage, I was actually really happy because this stage I did really, really well on. I was really happy. It was mentally challenging. You had to run up and you had to identify which targets to shoot based on the lethality of the weapon leaning up against the target. So they started with like a recoilless rifle out at the distance, then a battle rifle, and then a shorty AR. Once you did those three, they handed you a cipher problem. You had to solve it and then shoot those three targets in a different order. Then they set a math problem down and you had to solve it and shoot them in, again, a totally different order. I think I shot really, really well on this stage. And uh, like I said, I was, I was really happy. So it was kind of a, a ray of light up until taking off, of course, for the next stage. So here goes, this is uh, stage five. Shooter's ready. Hope when we get up there. Stand by. One, three, two. Yes, sir. Hit. 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 Next. Three, one, two. Yes, sir. Hit. 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 All right. Is that it? Load and show clear. Nice. All right, rifle's clear. 54-22. Is that a good time? Beat Stennett by 30 seconds. All right, stage six. Stage six, this is the long road across and back up out of the golf course and back over to the other side of Rock Castle. All right, when I got to this stage, I was done. I was done because this is where Matt threw in the elevation. This is where we had to go up the power line cut. We had to go up this enormous hill. I tell you, I got to the bottom of it, I was cussing him out. I got to the top of it, I was cussing him out. And I was sitting down again. Once I got to the top, I literally sat down and waited for a good five to ten minutes there, out in the woods, catching my breath, geared back up, got to the stage after just hiking through the woods the best that I could, sat down again, waited, and I think at this point, this is where I didn't turn on the GoPro at all because I just literally didn't care at this point, which I would have, but at any rate, like I said, I didn't. So we end up, uh, you know, getting the stage brief. I shot the stage pretty good. This is the one that I did not finish, and that's because I spent too much time on the 300-yard target. But I ran through. I shot the standing. They're running, running by targets good. Got up on the horse. The FL did its job. It actually made all the hits. I just took too much time trying to shoot the 300-yard target because I was winded and trying to get a good, solid position to shoot from on top of the horse. So this is another video that Bruce Perry, again, thank you, Bruce. He allowed me to use his stock footage. So this is Bruce shooting stage six, the, uh, the horse stage. So here goes, here's Bruce's video. And he shoots it really well with an FAL again. A little bit of funny stuff in there too. Sure. Stand by.
One more on the 50. Oh, one more to 50. Yep. 200. Where are you, you son of a bitch? Get in front of it. Hit! Shoot your pistol from behind this lock, do not move. Time. Really? No, you got it. 144 26. Holy fuck me. All right, stage seven, last stage. And this is like at the end. This was another one where I totally forgot to turn the GoPro on, and I am really upset with myself that I didn't turn on the GoPro because this is one of the more exciting stages that I encountered during this run. All right, this one was one that really challenged your mind. So we're in this stage, and they're giving a really long intel dump, all right, in the beginning of it for your stage brief. So you had to actually remember quite a bit of stuff and actually try to recall things you saw on the trail, which is this sign right here. So what you see right here is this sign is something we encountered somewhere, I believe, between stage five and stage six during that power line cut climb. I actually saw this sign. I saw this sign because when I read it, I said to myself, gosh, I'm a Marine. If I only had a Sharpie, I would so be tearing this sign up right now, okay, with a Sharpie. And then I saw the gnome at the bottom and I said, that is a cute gnome. I want that and I was going to steal it. I was going to take that gnome. Uh, but at this point, whatever it was, I said, well, maybe it's needed. It's a good thing it is, because actually the intel dump they're giving us on stage seven, they told us that the door you had to go in was the same color as the gnome's hat. In my head, I'm like, I remember that gnome. Was he wearing a red hat? Was he wearing a green hat? Gnomes wear red hats. I'm pretty sure gnomes wear red hats. So at any rate, that kind of intel and the fact that all the enemy in the three rooms that you had a choice to go in, but you were only allowed to go into two, all right, you had to go in the right door. You had to engage all the people that were wearing black. So you run in, they're wearing black. So you had to engage all the enemy in black. All right. And that the, the H high value target, he was marked with a blue diamond. So you had to remember all these things. And then you had to remember that the room that the high value target is in, after you engage all the enemy and you kill the high value target that's in the room that you get to choose uh, to go in, then you have to grab the sensitive site exploitation equipment from that room and take it out of there, and then you would complete the stage. So I actually ran in the correct room with a red door, gnome's hat, walked in, killed everybody in black, engaged the high value target who was wearing black but also had a blue diamond on him, ran out of the room, grabbed the laptop that was in there because that was a piece of sensitive site exploitation equipment I saw as I was running out. I'm being yelled at by the RO, stop, 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 because I just kept running. And I was literally moving to another bay at this point, and he told me I was done. I actually shot it pretty fast. I engaged all those targets with pistol. But again, like I said, I'm upset because I actually forgot to turn the GoPro on yet again. And so I'm using Bruce's video again, which he did the exact opposite of what I did. And I think he told me at this point he was a mental mush when it came to him listening to the intel dump in the beginning of this. And he ran into the first room and it didn't have the HVT in it. And so when he ran out of it, he grabbed a whole bunch of heavy sensitive site exploitation stuff and then skipped the bay that had the red door and went into the last bay that actually has a suicide bomber in it. So this is the exact opposite of what you should do. Thank you, Bruce, for letting me use it. And uh, like I said, as I briefed you on my stage, I hear you get to see Bruce run the stage and do exactly the opposite of what you should have done. So thanks again, Bruce. Here it is. Huh. Oh, they're colored in black. Oh, yeah. Oh, close, close, please.
SSC on this thing. Can I shoot this one again if we get back out or no? Uh, say that again. Can I shoot this one again when I get back? Oh, look at this guy. Do I pick that, this up? That you don't have to worry about. Do I need to recover that? You will need to recover that. That first target. It's a heavy son of a bitch. Okay, those are clear. We have one more time. Nothing here. There's nothing here. You chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> this looks HPV. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'm going to show you that walk from stage seven all the way back up to uh, to the finish. That's a it's 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 only a couple of hundred yards, I think. And you know, there you come in, and I was done at that point. I couldn't wait to ungear, get showered real quick, put on some clean clothes, go down to the cave. RO with Tiger for a while, always down there, and then uh, wake up so that we could do this stuff Saturday and Sunday. So again, real quick recap, I had a fantastic run, if you call it that. I probably sat down for a good hour. Um, so there was probably an hour of me sitting on my butt, just catching my breath out there for my four plus hour run, if you will, time that I was on the course. So um, it was, like I said, it was an amazing time. I did tell you that here in the end, and I'm going to, in a, sh in a short minute, throw up each of these vignettes as kind of the credits and the closings of this video so that you guys can read these and understand that what each one of these stages and what this match is about. Okay, it's about, it's about these folks. So read these, please, and understand what each one of these things are. Before I do that, I'll talk real quick about the upcoming run and guns that we have going on in the future. Um, the next one is Tiger's Run and Gun back at Rock Castle, it's November 3rd. Unfortunately, I will not be able to make this run and gun. Um, I'm going to be at my, my senior, my daughter's um, theater competition for the lead role. This is her last year doing this, and I can't miss that, so that's what I had to do. So for anybody who thought I was going to be at uh, Tiger's Match at Rock Castle, I apologize. I just found out about her competition, so I'm going to be attending that. I'm excited to see that. Um, Todd Bannis will be hosting a Toys for Tots run and gun at Bluegrass Sportsman's League on December 1st, and that weekend. I believe they actually have a night shoot and a USPSA shoot on the uh, Sunday following it. So I'm going to try my best to be there as an RO and a shooter, but I'm going to be running that. I think it's a 5K with five stages, so a run and gun during the day. And I'm going to use that run to actually prep for the January Oklahoma run and gun in Pawnee, the uh, Burial Mound Shooting Center. All right, and this year's winter challenge, because they always have a challenge, is a com block challenge. So I actually went and got myself a commie rifle. All right, so I'm going to take this commie rifle and I may shoot this at Todd's match in December so that I can go out there and uh, test out this Yugo and uh, see how, that, so how it, it does. Uh, I did put an ACOG on it because of my eyes. I'm an old man and I can't see without these contacts in and irons don't work too well. So uh, I will be competing with every other uh, just regular running gun out there because I can't, uh, with this optic, I can't compete with uh, the folks that are be looking for the commie um, Kami Pinko trophy that you guys want to win that are going to run your stuff as, you know, a period weapon and stuff. So we'll see how this thing does. We'll see you guys out there again. And like I said, I'm going to close this real quick with kind of a credits piece. And this credit piece is going to be each one of these. Take the time, read it, especially the last page, and read about their falling. All right, and everything that SFA does. So thanks again. Sorry it's a long video, but this one's important. Uh, I'll see you guys out there again. Thanks. Bye.